Well, so great to see you this morning. Happy summer to you. It is officially summertime. School is out. The kids are out of school for summer. It's summertime, uh, which means we are only 83 days away from college football kickoff, which <laughs> we're pretty excited about. Uh, but today we're, we're kicking off a brand new series where we're going to go all summer long through the most famous sermon ever preached, uh, the, the, the most famous sermon in history, the most famous sermon in any religion, the longest sermon that Jesus ever taught, the longest collection of messages that we have from Jesus, and it's just three short chapters. It's about 100 verses long, but it's created this long, long legacy that has shaped countless lives, both Christian and non-Christian, all throughout history. This sermon is so brilliant that we're still repeating it to this day, 2,000 years later. From Dr. Martin Luther King to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, from Bono to Bob Marley, this sermon has influenced some of the most influential people in our day and has shaped some of the most pivotal moments throughout human history. Uh, most notably, uh, the Sermon on the Mount had influence and impact in the Holocaust, in the civil rights movement, in the liberation of India. The Sermon on the Mount has impacted and influenced corporate boardrooms and nonprofits alike. The Sermon on the Mount has spoken into and shaped not just not just Christian circles, but uh, even outside of Christianity. Uh, Gandhi, who was Hindu, said that the Sermon on the Mount had so much influence in his life that he chose for the last 40 years of his life to read through and meditate on the Sermon on the Mount two times every single day for the last 40 years of his life. The Sermon on the Mount has some of the most quoted portions of all scripture. And yet for our time this summer, my hope, my prayer, our, our desire is that we don't just know more about the Sermon on the Mount. Our hope is that we are so significantly shaped by the content of this message that our lives are completely different. Because this isn't just uh, some helpful sayings and some principles to live by. This isn't just some random collection of teaching from Jesus. But it's, it's, it's an incredibly and intricately designed teaching that is organized in such a way that makes things a whole lot easier to remember and meditate on and live by. Jesus in this sermon walks through how we treat the poor. He talks about how we treat our enemies. He talks about divorce and remarriage. We get insight from Jesus on how he views adultery, how he views sex, how he views murder. Jesus talks about contempt. He uh, discusses name-calling, prayer and fasting, giving and generosity. Jesus in this sermon addresses how we can begin to address chronic anxiety in our life. Jesus covers topics in the Sermon on the Mount that, honestly, if they were brought up in church today, some would claim these are just, they're too personal, they're too controversial, they're too edgy. Jesus, what are you doing talking about these things in church today? Jesus, though, in this sermon, was drawing on actual, real-life, social, economic, and political realities of the day. And so this summer, we're going to walk through verse by verse, word for word, not skipping over anything, not avoiding or driving around those hard topics. We're going to address everything in this extraordinary manifesto of the Son of God himself. And our hope, our prayer is that God would use this passage of Scripture to shape us and set us free and show us what life looks like in the Jesus way. Now, let me just warn you, full transparency, uh, I want to be honest up front uh, that, that some of what we're going to hear, some of this teaching is going to ambush you. 
Some of what Jesus said is going to collide with where you're at in life. And yet I hope that we get this sense that God himself is speaking to us in this moment from his word. His word that's alive and active in our lives today. Theologian and commentator uh, Daniel Doriani said this, Among Jesus' teachings, the Sermon on the Mount is perhaps the most beloved and the best known, and yet the least understood and the hardest to obey. Oswald Chambers wrote this, The Sermon on the Mount is not just a series of principles to be obeyed apart from identification with Jesus Christ. We kind of want that in our life. We kind of want that in our walk with Jesus. Jesus, just tell me what you want me to do, and then I can follow it, and I can do that, and I can check off this list of things to do. But Oswald Chambers reminds us that this isn't just some principles to be obeyed apart from our identification with Jesus Christ. Sermon on the Mount is a statement of the life that we will live when the Holy Spirit is getting his way with us. So throughout this summer here at Mountain View, we are begging God to just till and, and toil the souls, soil of our hearts. We're asking God for something supernatural to happen in our lives so that we would have fresh eyes, fresh ears, that we would be challenged not just by persuasive words of sermons that are preached from Mountain View, but that the power of the Spirit would move and disrupt and shock some of us as we study this. And so right as Jesus is just about to settle in and kind of nestle into this long, extended collection of sermons, we catch Jesus doing what Really, Jesus was most famous for throughout his life and and ministry. We see that in chapter 4, right before the Sermon on the Mount, this is what Jesus is doing, starting in verse 23. And Jesus went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread Throughout all Syria, this is shocking. His, his fame isn't just spreading to religious people. It's spread up north to Syria, Scripture tells us. And they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and Jesus healed them. There's this entire gamut of people that are just being brought to the feet of Jesus in this moment because they know that there's something special about this man named Jesus. And great crowds, verse 25, great crowds followed him. No surprise there. Jesus is doing the miraculous. He's teaching the revolutionary, and great crowds decided to follow Jesus from Galilee, from the Decapolis, from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. We see these crowds of people starting to gather around and follow this man named Jesus. People from Galilee, from Syria up north, people from the Decapolis, which included the Greek and Roman cities of that day, people who had no categories uh, for the one true God of Israel, were now following this Messiah the Son of God. People from Jerusalem had started to follow the religious people in that day. And so with all of these crowds starting to press in, we see Jesus about to start and lean in to his most famous sermon ever. And this is how it goes in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain And when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, now let's just kind of set the the context here. In the first century, it would have been customary for rabbis in that day to stand when they're reading scripture and to sit when they're teaching, And so Jesus in this moment sat down and began to teach on this mountainside. It's called the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus sat down and taught 
on the mount, on a mountainside, and you can see a more modern day picture of it here, near the Sea of Galilee, and he's got two categories of people who are gathered around him. There's the crowd, and then he, there's Jesus' disciples. And the crowd would have been religious leaders. This would have been the, the biblical theologians and scholars of the first century, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, which is why Jesus, six different times in this sermon, says the exact same phrase. He says, you've heard it said, because these guys, these religious leaders, these Pharisees and these Sadducees, they would have heard that it was said from the Old Testament law. They would have even taught that it had been said in the past. They would have been the guys and the ones who were enforcing what had already been said in the past. And the crowd would have been the religious leaders, but there would have also been a, a group of people in the crowd known as the Freedom Fighters. They were part of this Freedom Fighter movement. It was this Jewish movement that uh, was fighting forcibly to liberate Israel through violent revolts. You may have heard of this group called the Zealots. In the crowd, there would have been the religious leaders, the Zealots. And this crowd gathered with Jesus on the mountainside would have also been the power brokers of Jesus' day. There would have been the people who were withdrawing from everyone else in society so that they could kind of go off and live their own life in hopes that this Messiah that was promised would just come and press the reset button. In this crowd, there would have been normal people just trying to navigate the everyday life. In this crowd, there would have been the poor, the sick, the hungry, those who were barely hanging on to life in the crowd, there would have been people who were actively being taken advantage of and oppressed by the Roman government. What we see in, in just the simple context of the message, we don't even have to read beyond one simple word, crowds. In this word crowds, we see that Jesus has a message for each and every person who was gathered on this mountainside 2,000 years ago. But it's also a reminder that Jesus has a message for each and every one of us. A message, of course, for sure, for the believers. A message that Jesus is going to talk about living life the Jesus way. It's a way that doesn't just get you through life, doesn't just help you to kind of survive the rigors of life, but a, a message for believers that this is how you thrive in life. But Jesus has also got a message for the people who are on the fence, uh, the people who are wondering what this whole Jesus thing is all about. Jesus has got a message for the new believers who are trying to navigate this new life in Christ, a life that's different from their life in religion. Jesus has got a message for people who are hurt by religion, people who have experienced church hurt, people who feel like the, the church isn't the safe place for them. People who come into a church and wonder, is this, even, is this even okay that I'm here? Because if they knew where I was and what I've done and where I've been, they probably wouldn't welcome me into this place. Jesus has got a message for people who've been hurt by, abused by, forgotten, left behind by the church. Jesus has a message for people who are skeptical of faith. And religion. And here's the good news for us 2,000 years later. Here at, while we're not at the Mount of the Beatitudes, we are at the Mountain View. And Jesus has a message for us. And what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount has resonance and meaning and speaks into our life today. Have you ever been driving down the road? And you're just driving and then you realize, like, I don't think I remember any of the last 20 minutes of this drive. Is it just me? And like, you don't even have to be texting. You don't have to be like listening to an amazing podcast or a great album or just reliving the, the great music of the 80s. You don't have to be doing any of that. You can just be uh, such, uh, such a common pattern of driving that you just totally forget and you totally miss the entire commute. Anybody with me or am I the only crazy one here? Okay, there's a few. Thank you. You can, uh, you can interact here. But if you've done that in driving, there's no doubt you've probably done that, like me, in church. 
where we, we become so familiar with something, like we've heard it so many times that it kind of just glazes over. And we think, well, I, I've heard this message before, and so I'm going to think about where I'm going to go to lunch today, and I hope that there's brunch reservations, and I hope they've got a seat at the table. For uh, You start to kind of plan through the rest of the afternoon. Oh, when we get home, i got to run by Home Depot. i got to fix this. i got to do that. My hope and my prayer is that, that this message, albeit a message of great familiarity to so many, is a message that hits anew in our hearts today. A message that strikes a new chord, not because of some creative teaching, but because of the work of the Spirit in our life. And so from the very beginning of this message, I think it's appropriate for us to jump to the end. We've seen that Jesus is gathered with his crowd. He's gathered with people who are following him, people who are wondering about him, people who are skeptical about him, people who have been hurt by other religious leaders like him. And yet at the very end, I think what's interesting is how people respond to this message. If you'll flip over to the very end, after these almost 100 verses, We see that in chapter 7, verse 28, when Jesus finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority, not as their scribes. Scripture says that people, as they listen to this message from Jesus, as they listen to this sermon, as they listen to this collection of sermons from Jesus, they were completely blown away. They were astonished. They were amazed. Are you hearing this? Did you hear Jesus when he said one thing about the law and another thing about his standard? It's this Greek word, ekpleso, which means to strike with panic, to shock, to astonish, to be left at a loss for words. Other translations say that people were, after they heard this, they were out of their mind completely astounded, not in a sense of celebrity shock, not in a sense of, oh, that is really cool teaching. No, they were amazed because Jesus spoke. Jesus taught as one who has actual authority. There's a weight, there's a gravity to the words that Jesus was speaking, unlike the the words that the scribes and the teachers of the law were speaking. Different than the other teachers that were mentioned, Jesus spoke with actual authority. And church, if you'll actually lean in to these teachings, if you'll actually listen anew to these words of Jesus, they will shock you. They'll amaze you. They'll probably bother you. They'll they'll likely make you uncomfortable. They'll challenge and disturb you, not just because they're a set of new ideas, No, they're a way of translating into a vision of human life that isn't just about surviving. It's not about how can I get through this day. No, this is a model that Jesus puts forth on how we can thrive in life. But let me tell you a temptation that we're all going to have, a temptation that I have even in teaching this, even in studying for this, in preparing for this. A temptation that we have is we we tend to want to sanitize and contextualize the words of Jesus in ways that allow us to stay comfortable in our life. Tim Mackey with the Bible Project says, the history of Christianity, okay, if we're going to sum it up, if we're going to boil it down here, the history of Christianity is a history of Christians trying to evade the Sermon on the Mount. Wait, that's not what I was hoping to hear. It's a history of us trying to evade the Sermon on the Mount and avoid living according to its plain meaning. We have this tendency, don't we? We have this tendency when it comes to the teaching of Scripture to somewhat sanitize certain things that Jesus said. Like, oh, he didn't really mean to actually live like that. Ah, when Jesus said that, he wasn't kidding around, but like, He knew we couldn't actually live up to that. And so why would we even want to try? So sometimes with with Scripture, we just flat out ignore it. We pretend that Jesus didn't really mean what he actually said. It's kind of an impossible ideal, so why even try to measure up? 
which led to a Jewish rabbi named Pinchas Lapid to say this, the history of the impact of the Sermon on the Mount can largely be described in terms of an attempt to domesticate everything in it that's shocking. We want to kind of train it down a little bit so that it listens to our commands instead of it commanding our life. This history of the impact of the Sermon on the Mount can largely be described in terms of an attempt to domesticate everything in it that's shocking, which can I tell you, that's everything. To domesticate everything that's demanding about the Sermon on the Mount and uncompromising and so render it harmless to our lives. The question we've got to wrestle with is this. Did Jesus actually intend his followers to live the way that he calls them? Or is this just a set of ideals that we should strive toward, try, work on, think about? Uh, Last week, I went scuba diving for the very first time. Uh, This is like, I'm I'm born and raised in Tennessee, and like this is something that we don't even have access to in the state of Tennessee. What what may be surprising to you is we do have access to electricity and running water, and (laughs) scuba diving is not part of that list. But I went scuba diving for the very first time in my entire life last week. I know some of this is like regular stuff to you, but back in 2015, we moved from Tennessee to California to South Orange County, and we were totally blown away. Like, we're like 10 minutes from the Pacific Ocean. We are 10 minutes from the left coast, like the best coast, and we've been at both, and I can tell you, left coast is the best coast. Amen? Amen? Come on, y'all, this is easy. <laughs> I'm like lobbing softballs here for Pujols to knock out of the park. And the left coast is the best coast. Like, there are still moments almost 10 years later that us rednecks look out and we're like, man, I can't believe that we live here. And up until last week, I was last week years old, uh, the first time I went scuba diving in my life. And can I just tell you, it, it changed me. I've always been blown away from what I've seen at the surface. But then when I went down, not just in a snorkeling kind of way, not just kind of flirting with getting into the water. No, I went all the way down to the ocean floor. I was completely astounded by what I saw and what I experienced. Seeing the ocean like we do on a daily basis here in, in SoCal is one thing. It's an amazing thing. It's a thing that uh, we still are blown away by. I hope we never lose the awe and the wonder of that. Seeing it at the surface level is one thing. It's a whole nother level when we get beyond the surface of the ocean. Uh, Most days, if we're, unless we're scuba diving, we don't have any categories of what's underneath, what's under the surface. Uh, This photo was taken uh, uh, Not by me when I was scuba diving. (laughs) But in the same waters that I was scuba diving in, it's astonishing. We get blown away by just seeing the surface level of the ocean. But when you get underneath the surface, we can be blown away. Which I think is what Jesus is doing and capturing with the Sermon on the Mount when it comes to our own human nature. What we observe with each other is just human behavior. We interact with each other based on what can be seen, but we don't know what's below the surface with those interactions with other people. We don't know what people are really thinking, what's going on underneath what they're saying, what they're doing, how they're acting. But yet underneath all of these behaviors are our thoughts and our attitudes, what we value, who we love, who we hate. Underneath the surface of our lives are judgments, contempt, pride, superiority, fears, insecurities. And I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about me. Underneath what is seen are all of these things that have been shaped by our wounds and our childhood experiences and the hurts that we have endured all throughout our life. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus addresses, Jesus gets at what's underneath the surface and what's not seen. 
if we're being honest, almost all of our life, all of what's seen in our life is just a surface version of us. It's a curated version of us that's carefully guarded to create this ideal version of ourselves. Almost all of our life is a surface curated version. We curate interactions with others, and others do the same. To the extent that we have no clue what's under the surface of our lives. Religion, up to the point that Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, religion had just dealt with external behaviors. Jesus, in preaching the Sermon on the Mount, begins to deal with all of the internal heart issues. He discerns what's underneath the surface, peels back the layers of what is seen, because Jesus is not just interested in behavior modification. Jesus is interested in shaping a completely new way of living. Jesus is interested in this level of discipleship and transformation that goes deeper, that goes beyond the surface level. John Mark Comer in his new book, Practicing the Way, says this, contrary to what many assume, Jesus did not invite people to convert to Christianity. He didn't even call people to become Christians. Jesus invited people to apprentice under him into a whole new way of living, to be transformed. This entire message, this entire Sermon on the Mount, is Jesus drilling into our core motives, into what drives us, into the forces that are operating in our private works, the hidden reasons that we do the things that we do. Just take, for example, in his intro, in his very first part of the message in chapter 5, Jesus takes six controversial topics and uses the same phrase. You've heard it said, but I'm here to tell you, Jesus, in each of these you've heard it said statements, calls back to Old Testament Hebrew law. You have heard that the law actually says, and then Jesus puts his own words with the same authority as the Old Testament as he's speaking, and it completely blows people away. You've heard it said, and he quotes six Old Testament laws, quotes God, affirms it, and then he goes deeper. The first topic that Jesus takes is murder. (laughs) Okay, Jesus, way to ease your way into this. I'm not sure how I feel about that, but let's talk about murder. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. He says this, you have heard it said, this is the Old Testament law, you've heard it said, you shall not murder. Whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I, Jesus, say to you that everyone who's angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Uh, Jesus takes this at a surface level. You've heard it said, you shall not murder. To which all of us, or at least I hope all of us, would say, I haven't done that good. I'm fine. I'm okay. I haven't done this. Jesus, we're good. I should be okay with this whole Christianity thing. But Jesus drills down and says, but I'm here to tell you that if anyone's been angry with his brother, if anyone has said, you fool, which is the Aramaic term raka, which means empty-headed. It's insinuating a person's stupidity, their inferiority. You're not worth anything. You're just trash. You're not even worthy of being treated like a human, empty of value and meaning. You're worthless. This is all wrapped up into this word, raka. Jesus goes under the surface, addresses the thoughts and intents of the heart to address the root of murder is anger and hatred. Can I preach for a minute? You know the person who thinks differently than you? The person who votes differently than you, Uh, that individual who has a different worldview, uh, an alternative perspective about life and relationships, you know that person that you can't stand? Jesus is saying, hey, it's great that you haven't killed them, but there's no difference between killing someone and calling them an idiot, viewing them as worthless. 
Y'all, Jesus is already all up in our business. And he's just getting started. Jesus goes from murder to sex, natural progression, (laughs) to divorce, to the promises that we make, to the forgiveness that we withhold, and then begins to cast a vision for how we handle criticism in life. Come on, y'all. Do we need, to, we need to know about that? How do we handle criticism? How do we handle opposition? And he closes chapter five by talking about how you should respond to your enemies. This is what Jesus says. Literally, this is so shocking. I wanted to hit you anew this morning. Jesus said, you've heard it that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. This is actual teaching from religious leaders. Love your neighbor, hate your enemy. This is what's been taught. This is what's been said. But I say to you, Jesus says, love your enemies. What? Pray for those who persecute you. Jesus, you've lost me. Uh, This is shocking. This is pressing in on our comfort. Can you just hear these words anew this morning? Maybe it's shocking to you. It's one of the most shocking and difficult things that Jesus calls us to do. You've heard it said to love your enemies and, or uh, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus goes on, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and the good, and sins reign on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who just love you, what reward do you have? Don't the tax collectors even do the same? And if you greet only your brother, what more are you doing than others? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Jesus here is framing for us this new ethic that says you are never more like God than when you're forgiving someone who's hurt you. You're never more a child of your Father in heaven than when you're forgiving that person. You're praying for them. And for some of you right now, we're not even drilling deep into this text, but someone's coming to mind. Somebody that voted differently, that that, that looks differently, then acts differently, that, that views life and relationships differently than you. And today, through this revolutionary, world shaking teaching, God wants to set you free. The most famous sermon that Jesus ever gave is an invitation to life in the kingdom. Jesus is addressing not what's on the surface, not what we can see in others, not our own carefully created and curated social media version of interacting. No, Jesus is exposing the human condition under the surface and inviting you to let him heal those most sacred parts and secret parts of your heart and life. Jesus' perspective is how does, how does God treat evil people? How does God treat good people? God causes the sun to rise and sends rain to both. Even the weather patterns declare the glory and the generosity of our God. And this is just chapter five. Are you exhausted yet? Chapter 6, Jesus covers praying and giving and fasting, and he's not just talking about doing these spiritual practices, but why do we do them? Why do we pray? Are you praying just so that others will say, oh, look at how spiritual that person is? When you're giving, uh, just dropping another fat check in here, no big deal. When we're fasting, and there's always that person who you're like, oh, how you doing? Uh, You know, I'm doing great considering it's day 37 of a 40-day fast. Like, why are we doing these spiritual disciplines? Jesus gets at the heart of them. He says, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Because the reality is we spend our life looking at the activities and behaviors and the sins and the problems of everyone else. And Jesus invites us to look at our own lives. There's never been a sermon like this before. If you have the courage, if you're prepared to lean in this summer, Jesus wants to do something in you. Jesus wants to do something in me. Maybe you've read this sermon a dozen times. My prayer is it's going to hit you like it's never hit you before. And for some of us, it's going to step on our toes. 
For some of us, it's going to kick us in our shin, maybe slap us on the cheek. But I want you to think about your own life, your own world, your own secrets, what's under the surface, because Jesus wants to help so that he can heal us and transform us and shape us and remove shame and let us experience the freedom of life in the kingdom. We're going to do some work together, y'all. It's going to shock you. It might hurt you. But what's on the other side is freedom. Because we're tempted to think we're pretty good. I haven't killed anybody. I haven't broken up any marriages. I think I'm pretty good. And yet all of a sudden, the gravity of these teachings of Jesus fall on us. And we realize and recognize the bias and the prejudice and the, and the brokenness in our own heart. The pride and the superiority. And Jesus has given us this teaching not to shame us, not to condemn us, but to diagnose us in this spiritual moment because he wants to set you free. That's the gospel. Jesus already knows everything about you. He knows the things that you show publicly. He knows the things that you hide privately. And it turns out that even with the full knowledge of everything about you, he said, I will joyfully go to the cross for you. I see so much value in you, not the curated version of you, but who you really are. So much value that he laid down his life for you. That's why the crowd was shocked and amazed and astonished. Because our sin condition is far worse than we realize. But his love for us is far greater than we could ever imagine. So will you join us on this journey? Each and every week, we're going to take verse by verse, section by section. We are literally going to drag our feet through this sermon. So I want to invite you to spend time reading, spend time listening and praying, God, what do you want to do in me? The temptation for you is the same temptation for me. Who needs to hear this message? What friend do I have? What family member? Oh, I wish I would brought this person to church. No, this is for, this is for me. This is for you. Yes, bring people. But as you engage in this sermon, ask the question, God, what do you want to do in me? Next week, we're going to cover the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who blank. Jesus fills in all the blanks for us. So read ahead. Spoiler alert, it's going to be great. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we're grateful. We're grateful for such clarity around what you're inviting us to. Jesus, we're grateful that you don't just call us to normal, that you call us to a, a new, you call us deeper. And so God, this, this summer, would you do in us more than just the surface work and behavior modification? God, would you do in us what only you can do? Would you shape us to run with reckless abandon toward the way that you've designed us to live? We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.